Welcome to the problem. Let's talk about punishment. Now get locked up. They won't let me out. They won't let me out. Ahoy hoy, I'm Luna, and I've been kind of deep in the internet recently because of a clip that arose a month or two ago. In fact, I'm not really sure how much of this someone might not know, uh, so let me define some things real quick like. Alright, so uh, truancy is repeatedly skipping school, deterrent is a thing that makes you not do a thing, and rehabilitation is guided self-care. I should probably just... sorry. So a friend of a friend posted this up on Twitter. Now depending where you're coming from, this clip can sound like Yanny or Laurel. As a prosecutor and law enforcement, I have a huge stick. The school district has got a carrot. Let's work in tandem around our collective objective and goal, which is to get those kids in school. And I believe a child going without an education is tantamount to a crime. So I decided I was going to start prosecuting parents for truancy. Yeah, no, law cop. She's a cop. Oh boy, she's a cop. All right, well, that is interesting to hear from now presidential candidate Kamala Harris. Uh, without making the assumption that going to school is a moral good on its own, what is the actual problem with truancy? In the long term, evidence reveals truancy as a predictor of poor adult outcomes, including violence, uh, marital instability, job instability, adult criminality, and incarceration. Moreover, truancy exerts a negative effect on community because of its correlation with delinquency, crime, and other negative adult outcomes. The connection that was statistically proven between elementary school truancy, high school dropouts, who will become a victim of crime, and who will become a perpetrator of crime. Definitely some things to avoid there. Wow. Okay, uh, let's fix this. Let's do this. Uh, what was your plan? On my letterhead, now let me tell you something about my letterhead. When you're the DA of a major city in this country, usually the job comes with a badge. And there is often an artistic rendering of said badge on your stationery. So I sent a letter out on my letterhead to every parent in the school district. A friend of mine actually called me and he said, Kamala, my wife got the letter. She freaked out. She brought all the kids into the living room, held up the letter, said, if you don't go to school, Kamala's going to put you and me in jail. <laughs> yes, we achieved a tend intended effect. Well, let me check the cause real quick before we throw some kids' parents in jail. Uh, in a meta-analysis of the causes, effects, and solutions for truancy by Bill Rivers, uh, link in the doobly-doo, he splits the causes into four groups. Family factors, school factors, economic influences, and student variables. Eh? Uh, family factors is like household income, uh, parental supervision, uh, and education, and stuff like that. 30% of kids skipping school had nobody at home for five plus hours after school, where only 11% always had supervision after school, strongly suggesting a link between supervision and school attendance. 33% uh, of kids skipping class in high school did not live with their parents. 14% lived with both. Uh, did, did I just dunk on Kamala Harris? Because if parental supervision leads to less truancy, and your solution to truancy is to remove the parents? That means your entire premise is based on a contradictory strategy. Or, okay, two points a day isn't enough for y'all privileged punks. Income, right? So uh, students are more likely to skip school if they live in a family that makes less than 15,000 a year. That means under Kamala's plan here, if you are poor, your child is much more likely to get both of you 
imprisoned. School factors that may cause truant behavior include, but are not limited to, school climate, class size, attitudes, ability to meet each student's diverse needs, and school policy regarding truancy. And if you are poor, you're much more likely to live in an area with larger classes and fewer specialists. If you're really screwed, no specialists. So basically, if you're disadvantaged, you are at severe risk of punishment. Uh, this creates an environment of fear that isolates students from their education, making them feel alien among fellow students, especially if the parents get arrested. Okay, let's say you're fine with that. It gives a good motivation to make sure your children go to school. Or at least that's what's proposed in the prosecutor's framework. In that framework, let's look at isolation as a punishment. In 1890, when someone's unjust extra punishment while on death row was raised to the Supreme Court, we were given a concise opinion from the court about the effects of isolation. A considerable number of the prisoners fell even after a short confinement into a semi-fatuous condition from which it was next to impossible to arouse them, and others became violently insane. Others still fell to suicide, while those who stood the ordeal better were not generally reformed and in most cases did not recover sufficient mental activity to be of any subsequent service to the community. That's the Supreme Court. We've known for a while. Yet, we will throw some away for petty theft. I'm reminded of an account of this torture from Wilbert Rideau, a journalist who served 44 years for manslaughter, of which 12 were cumulatively spent in solitary. Deprived of all human contact, you lose your feeling of connectedness to the world. You lose your ability to make small talk, even with the guard who shoves your meal through the slot in the door. You live entirely in your head, for there is nothing else. You talk to yourself, answer yourself. You become paranoid, depressed, sleepless. To ward off madness, you must give your mind something to do. In 1970, I counted the 358 rivets that held my steel cell together, over and over. Every time the walls seemed to be closing in on me, I counted them again, to give my mind something to fasten on to. So no, it tends to make them worse. Uh, but we're talking about kids, right? Nobody's gonna throw kids into solitary confinement, right? Sure, but if we put their parents in prison, they'll likely have to deal with more isolation. And this shows that extreme isolation, or alienation, is not just unhealthy, it's explicitly harmful. If isolation isn't the correct punishment, what is? Is there a form of punishment that serves as an effective deterrent? To go back to the truancy paper, Tobin suggests that imposing more serious punishments has worsened truant behavior, thus proving punishment to be counterproductive in the fight against chronic absenteeism. Severity of punishment doesn't affect deterrence rates. Length of punishment doesn't affect deterrence rates. Most of the time, the only deterrent to crime was, I'm gonna get caught if I do this, so I won't. The students are already harassed by police for skipping school. And cutting out the gray area means having a line where too absent removes you and your parents from wider society, like you're a political dissident in North Korea, and it looks like that lasts for the rest of their lives. And if punishment makes the problem worse, we are going to need a different solution. I'll repeat that. Punishment does not work. Punishment furthers the divide between people who have made mistakes and their humanity, both in their perception and in ours. What's the solution? I say rehabilitation, redemption, 
giving people the tools for which they might grow as a person. In a study by the Department of Justice of people arrested for addiction, basically, it was shown with sufficient confidence that taking care of people in prison reduces recidivism rates by 10 percentage points over one year, 12 over two. It was also shown with sufficient confidence that continuing that care once the prisoners were released reduced recidivism rates by 33 percentage points over one year, 37 over two. I posit that if we started with therapy instead of isolation, we could extend this to the entire bloated prison system. We cannot be held as arbiters of behavioral progress if we make no commitment to social and societal change. Look, here's the main thing. Depending on sentence, these people will be among us again one day. We can't condemn people to life in prison for smoking pot or skipping school or, God forbid, being poor. They're going to have to reintegrate into society one way or another. In Wido's words, every year, men from California's Pelican Bay and other supermax prisons around the nation are released directly from the vacuum of their cells into free society to live and work among you and your loved ones. As a matter of self-preservation, maybe we should all join the prisoner's request for rehabilitative opportunities. What we are doing is not working, and the best way forward is to restore justice to the justice system. To humanize and to help. To rehabilitate and redeem. To forgive even if we don't forget to lift those who have done wrong from their dark place and help them overcome the stains of misdeed that may never wash out, that they might become but a small mark on an otherwise beautiful portrait, should we simply choose to keep painting instead of burning the canvas and tossing the ashes to the winds. It's not that I believe we are better than this, but I believe that we can do better than this. If we want a better world, We'll have to start first with how we treat those who have done wrong. I would appreciate feedback. I would appreciate comments. I will remove abuse because nobody needs that. Uh, bibliography and Patreon are in the description. I have been Luna, and I will see you later. Bye! So there's a great part in this article, I really want to blast it, all those participation trophy hating yeehaws, uh, when talking about how the literal expectations given to them by their environment uh, affects their success, the meta-analysis dives into a survey on what these kids were told by parents. For example, students that answered probably won't graduate from high school and definitely won't attend college committed higher truant behavior at 44.5 and 30% respectively than their peers who answered definitely will graduate from high school and definitively will go to college at 15 and 12% respectively. There it is, the evidence. You are a special snowflake. So make sure to tell yourself and all of your loved ones because that will help you succeed. And I think you should succeed. I must succeed! I must succeed!